China just became the only country to bring back samples from the moon's far side, a place so difficult to reach that no one else has even tried. In 2026, they're launching Chang'e 7 with something completely different, a six-legged flying robot powered by rocket propulsion. This machine can hop, climb, and fly into permanently shadowed craters where traditional rovers simply can't go. But why is China racing to explore these dark craters? And what technology are they using that SpaceX hasn't developed yet? The answer lies in what China discovered during their Chang'e 6 mission and what they're planning to do with that knowledge. On June 25, 2024, a small capsule touched down in Inner Mongolia carrying 1,935 grams of lunar soil. This wasn't just any moon rock collection. These samples came from the Apollo Basin, nestled inside the South Pole Aitken Basin a massive impact crater formed over four billion years ago. We're talking about a crater so enormous it spans 2,500 kilometers, roughly the distance from Beijing to Hainan, with a depth of nearly 13 kilometers. It's the oldest and largest impact crater in our entire solar system. So, what makes this ancient scar on the moon so valuable? Scientists believe the colossal impact that created this basin punched through the moon's crust and threw up material from deep within the lunar interior, material that's been sitting there untouched for billions of years. If that's true, these samples could reveal secrets about how the moon formed and what happened in the early days of our solar system. But getting those samples required solving a problem that stumped everyone else. The far side of the moon has no direct line of sight to Earth. The moon rotates at the exact same pace it orbits our planet, keeping one face permanently turned away from us. Radio signals can't pass through 3,474 kilometers of solid rock. Without communication, you can't control a spacecraft, receive data, or even know if your lander survived. China's Solution they launched a relay satellite called Kuekiao-2 two months before Chang'e-6 even left Earth. This satellite weighs 1,200 kilograms and carries a massive 4.2-meter parabolic antenna, the largest ever flown on a deep space relay spacecraft. Positioned in lunar orbit, Kuekiao-2 acts as a bridge, catching signals from the far side and bouncing them back to Earth. The satellite generates 1,350 watts of power from rotating solar wings and carries 500 kilograms of fuel to maintain its precise position for 8 to 10 years. But even with this relay system, the challenges weren't over. The moon still partially blocks signals at certain points in its orbit. Communication windows on the far side are significantly shorter than on the near side, Chang'e 5, which landed on the near side, had 22 hours for sample collection. Chang'e 6 had only 14 hours. How do you cut collection time by a third without compromising the mission? China's engineers made the spacecraft smarter, instead of sending individual commands for every single action, which Chang'e 5 required about 1,000 instructions to complete. They programmed Chang'e 6 to execute sequences autonomously. Ground control sends a command, and the probe performs multiple related tasks using sensor data to verify each step succeeded before moving to the next. This closed loop operation reduced the required instructions to around 400. The lander could make decisions on its own. On June 1, 2024, the lander touched down inside the Apollo Basin. The terrain there is brutal, pockmarked with impact craters of all sizes because the far side faces outward toward the rest of the solar system, absorbing asteroid and meteorite strikes that the near side avoids. Landing required a sophisticated sensor suite. Microwave and laser systems measure distance and speed. Optical cameras detected obstacles, and gamma-ray sensors measured altitude through particle detection so the engine could shut down at precisely the right moment. 
The landing legs absorbed the impact, protecting the equipment. Then the real work began. The lander deployed two collection methods, a robotic arm to scoop surface material and a drill to extract samples from up to two meters below the surface. Both worked flawlessly. On June 3rd, the ascent vehicle, sitting on top of the lander, launched from the lunar surface carrying those samples into orbit. Two days later, it performed an autonomous rendezvous and docking with the orbiter, transferred the samples into a re-entry capsule, and completed its mission. The orbiter spent 4.5 days flying back to Earth. Just before arrival, it released the return capsule, which performed a skip re-entry, bouncing off the atmosphere once before making its final descent. The entire mission lasted 53 days and achieved something no other nation has accomplished. But here's what makes China's 2026 plan so different from anything SpaceX or NASA is attempting. Chang'e 7 isn't bringing another drill or a bigger rover. They're sending a six-legged flying robot to the moon's south pole, specifically to those permanently shadowed craters that might contain water ice. These craters have never seen sunlight, ever. Temperatures drop to minus 240 degrees Celsius. No wheeled rover can climb down into these vertical-walled pits and climb back out. Traditional aircraft can't fly in the moon's vacuum. So what exactly is this hopping robot? China calls it a smart hopper, and it integrates multiple capabilities into one machine. The six-leg detector can walk, climb, jump, crawl, and fly using rocket propulsion. Think of it as a rocket-equipped scout that hops from location to location. When it encounters terrain too steep for its legs, it fires thrusters to leap over obstacles or fly into craters. When it needs precision, it walks. This isn't a simple drone or rover. It's an AI-powered explorer designed specifically for environments that would trap or destroy conventional vehicles. The reason China is investing in this technology comes down to one critical resource, water ice. If those permanently shadowed craters contain frozen water, and orbital data strongly suggests they do, it changes everything about future lunar exploration. Water ice can be split into hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen for breathing, hydrogen, and oxygen for rocket fuel. Instead of hauling every kilogram of life support and propellant from Earth at enormous cost, future missions could refuel at the moon. This is why China is focusing on the South Pole, while others target different regions. The Aitken Basin at the South Pole is scientifically valuable for understanding the moon's formation, but those shadowed craters are strategically valuable for enabling long-term presence. A lunar research station needs water. Crewed missions need fuel. Mining operations need life support. Finding and confirming accessible ice deposits is the prerequisite for everything else. Chang'e 7's hopping robot will scan these craters, analyze ice concentration, and test extraction techniques. The data collected will determine where Chang'e 8 establishes infrastructure and where future research stations get built. China isn't just exploring. They're surveying construction sites. SpaceX is developing Starship to land on the moon. But Starship is designed to bring massive payloads to the lunar surface, not explore difficult terrain. NASA's Artemis program focuses on landing astronauts in relatively accessible areas. No one else is deploying flying robots to probe the deepest, darkest corners of the lunar South Pole. China recognized that accessing certain critical resources requires a completely different approach. The hopper can traverse dozens of kilometers, reaching regions no mission has studied before. Each hop, each rocket-assisted flight into a shadowed crater, gathers data that brings lunar colonization closer to reality. Because that's the ultimate goal here. Chang'e 7 and 8 aren't standalone missions. They're the foundation for permanent human presence. If Chang'e 7 confirms substantial water ice deposits in 2026, and Chang'e 8 demonstrates resource extraction techniques, 
China will have answered the two biggest questions about lunar sustainability. Where's the water, and can we use it? That puts them years ahead in establishing the infrastructure needed for long-term operations. So, here's what this really means. While the world watches SpaceX build the biggest rocket ever, and NASA plan Artemis landings, China is quietly solving the problem everyone else is ignoring. How to actually survive on the moon long term. They're not focused on who gets there first. They're focused on who can stay. That six-legged hopper launching in 2026 isn't just a cool piece of technology. It's a strategic asset designed to locate and map the exact resources needed to turn the moon from a destination into a home. Water ice means fuel production. Fuel production means you don't need to carry everything from Earth. And that changes the entire economics of space exploration. Chang'e 6 proved China can execute complex missions on the far side that no one else has attempted. Chang'e 7 will prove they can access resources in the harshest environments. Chang'e 8 will prove they can use those resources. By the time other nations establish their first lunar outposts, China will have already tested the systems needed to keep them running. The moon race isn't about flags anymore. It's about infrastructure, resources, and whoever controls the water controls the future of lunar operations. China understands this. The question is, does everyone else? If you found this breakdown valuable, hit that like button and subscribe to Atlas Space for more in-depth analysis of the space industry's biggest developments. What do you think about China's hopping robot strategy? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. Former NASA Administrator Mike Griffin just attacked SpaceX's orbital refueling system. He claims it's too complex, has too many failure points, and in his words, it simply cannot work. His solution? Replace Starship with two SLS rockets per mission, plus a new lunar lander built entirely under NASA control. But here's where it gets interesting. While Griffin demands this massive overhaul, NASA's own Orion just hit another delay because of a stain on its thermal barrier. So which system is really the problem here? Let's start with what Griffin actually wants. He's proposing we abandon Artemis III, as currently planned, and go back to an architecture he championed almost two decades ago. One SLS rocket launches the crew in Orion. Another SLS rocket launches a lunar lander. They meet in lunar orbit. The crew transfers over, lands on the moon, then returns to Orion for the trip home. Sound familiar? It should. It's basically Apollo with bigger rockets. On paper, this sounds straightforward. NASA controls everything. No private contractor complications. No unproven refueling technology.